Last time we looked at uh, aircraft configuration in which we discussed uh, two main things. One is that given the same requirements, one can come up with totally different configurations, both of which could meet the requirements. We saw many examples. We saw three examples, one in the mid 50s for a strategic bomber, one in the mid 80s for, a, uh, <coughs> for an aircraft and then joint, uh, joint strike fighter in the mid 90s. And then we looked at uh, the options available or the menu card available for uh, arriving at the configuration, wing, fuselage. And in tail I mentioned that there are many letters of the English alphabet like T, U, Y, inverted Y, V, inverted V. So all of them we will see today. And I also discussed about wing layout, high wing, mid wing, low wing, the pros and cons. So today we start looking at the tail plane. Now before we look at the layout of the tail plane, we should first understand clearly and unambiguously what are the requirements of the tail plane. So there are two kinds of tail planes, the vertical tail and the horizontal tail. So we look at one by one. The horizontal tail is designed based on three basic requirements. The first one being trim and it has to trim the aircraft to cancel the pitching moment that is present typically in the wing. Typically a wing will have a nose down pitching moment by itself. So you need a tail either located behind to carry a download to cancel this moment or a canard in the front to carry an upload to cancel this moment. So this is the basic primary requirement of the tail plane. Then we have stability requirements. And here stability includes both static and dynamic stability. The requirement is that if the aircraft enters pitching motion due to some disturbance or due to any other reason except intentional when the pilot does a control, if the aircraft enters or has some kind of a pitching motion, it should have a tendency of coming back to the original position and also eventually it should come back to the original position. If this happens on its own, the aircraft is statically and dynamically stable. If on the other hand, you have just a tendency of coming back, but you offshoot and do not come back, then you have static stability, but dynamic instability. And if you have tendency to come back on your own and eventually the oscillations damp out and you actually come back to the own, you also are dynamically stable. So you need a minimum surface of the tail to give you stability. The third requirement is control. When you intentionally want to create imbalance in the pitching moment. Three important requirements where the pilot wants to control the pitch motion of the aircraft intentionally. These are the three requirements which normally govern the sizing. I am not saying that they are the only requirements. I am saying these are the key requirements. When you start doing the design calculations, you will realize that if you meet these requirements, generally you would have met all the requirements. The first requirement is nose wheel lift off. What is nose wheel lift off? We will watch a small video. This is a huge aircraft called as C5A Galaxy, which has got two main landing gear legs with multiple number of wheels and one nose landing gear leg with again multiple number of wheels. So let us watch. this aircraft during takeoff. You can see the nose landing gear consists of four wheels. This is the first main landing gear leg, four wheels, second leg, four wheels and again four on each side. So there are eight plus eight, 16 main landing gear wheels. So it's a landing gear complex, main landing gear complex. And then you have a nose landing gear. Watch the flaps which are here, here these are the flaps and also these are the flaps, inboard flaps. What are these? These are flap horns or the mechanism to deflect the flaps. The flaps are already down, deflected downwards. Now I want you to observe whenever you see the nose landing gear. 
all focus on this nose landing gear leg. There you go. So this is called as nose wheel lift off. Now, while watching the nose landing gear, you missed something, or you missed watching something. So we will go back. I would now like you to focus on the horizontal tail of the aircraft. Don't look anywhere else. Just look at the horizontal tail, which is going to come in the view very soon. There you go. Now you will get the horizontal tail. There you go. Can you see the elevators going up? Correct? So this up elevator, what should be the size, what should be the angle, how much up? This is decided or designed by the requirement of nose wheel lift off. So at the worst condition of center of gravity, when the moment required to lift the nose is the largest, that would be at the rearmost CG location. It's a very heavy aircraft, one of the heaviest aircraft we have ever flown. So when the center of gravity of this aircraft is at the worst or the most rear position during takeoff, at that point, how much moment needs to be created by deflecting this tail, this vertical tail, uh, horizontal tail, this is an elevator actually, this is an elevator. So how much is to be deflected up so that the nose can be lifted off. If this angle is very high, then it will start creating a lot of drag. So we will then increase the area and reduce the angle. But when you increase the area, it becomes a heavy tail. So there is a trade-off. And the area of this is decided, area and deflection. And then you see, once it is completed, it is going to slowly come back to normal. So this is an example of nose wheel. Okay. Then we have low, low speed flight with flaps down. So if you look at an aircraft during landing, you will find that the flaps are maximum down. During that time, there is going to be a huge pitching moment created by the flap deflection. And this pitching moment has to be countered by the horizontal tail deflection. So, we are not sure right now whether the size of the horizontal tail will be get decided by lift off requirement or the size will be dictated by the area required at the landing speed of the flat of the stabilizer to overcome or the elevator to overcome the moment created because of flat deflection at low speeds. Which of these will be more? You do not know. The third requirement is transonic maneuvering. During transonic flight, uh, the aircraft wing is going to be subjected to shock waves, okay? And therefore, during transonic flight, there will be sudden losses in lift, or there will be an imbalance in the lift generation. That will create a disturbance in the pitch equilibrium. And in that condition, if you want to maneuver, you need to have enough area of the elevator. So these three requirements typically decide the area of the elevator. Which of them is maximum? That will decide the area of the elevator to be provided. Now, not every aircraft does transonic maneuvering. So that is only applicable for those aircraft. So for the vertical tail, we have the same three requirements, trim, stability, control. But there is a difference. The trim for a vertical tail comes from the requirement for engine failure in a multiple engine aircraft. Now, we do not talk of single engine aircraft. If in a single engine aircraft, the aircraft engine fails, you simply pray to God and land. But if it is a multi engine aircraft, it may not be safe to land. Who knows? It may be, you may be at a speed at which it is better to continue. And even if you want to land, the instability that will be created or the imbalance in the trim because of uh, engine failure. So one side, you will lose a part or whole of the thrust. If you have four engines and one fails, you will have partial loss of thrust. If you have two engines and one fails, it will be total loss of thrust on one side. So there will be imbalance. There will be a yaw imbalance 
this yaw movement has to be countered by deflecting of the vertical uh, tail moving portion called rudder. So, the size of the rudder will be decided based on now uh, normally it is the takeoff condition which is because it is a low speed uh, condition. And then if you have a single engine just in the nose one propeller, the propeller does not throw the air straight behind, it throws the air in annulus fashion, correct. Right? There will be a spiral flow of air. So, this spiral flow of air depending on whether the rotation is clockwise or anticlockwise, it is going to hit the vertical tail on one side. So, what will happen because of that? There will be yaw imbalance. Imagine there is a spiral of air coming from the propeller and hitting the vertical tail. Definitely on one side there will be motion. Normally it is on the left side or the starboard side. So, the nose will tend to move towards the left. So, how do you counter it? You counter it either by deflecting the rudder little bit during takeoff so that the trim is provided. In some cases you fix the rudder itself or you fix the aircraft vertical tail at some angle. So, you make it asymmetrically mounted, it is not visible directly unless you look very carefully. So, I want you to look at it and if you can locate a nice picture or a video which shows this particular thing, it will be nice to put it on the modal page. Then stability, stability will be in the yawing motion. So, again aircraft is in level flight, it is trimmed and now there is some side force for some reason, let us say wind disturbance, the aircraft tends to go on the left side or on the right side. You should have enough vertical tail area at a enough length from the center of gravity so that the balancing moments are able to cancel out the expected disturbance. And then <clears throat> this is a normal flight, you also have something called as Dutch roll. Have you heard of this particular behavior? What is Dutch roll? Can somebody explain? What is meant by Dutch roll? How many of you have taken part in skating, roller skating or ice skating? Okay. So, what happens if you open your legs and if you start going at high speed, do you have a motion in which one leg goes like this, the other leg, the body starts moving in sides. So, where you do not want to move sideways, you want to move forward, but when you want to move forward and you have only one side pushing, the tendency of the body is to go this way, correct. So, the name Dutch roll has come from that, from the wavy motion of a skater, that is Dutch roll. So, what is Dutch roll? Only left and right, why not right and left? So, why does it happen? What is it? It is not an instability. It is not an instability. It is a general, it is a natural behavior of an aircraft. So, let me show you one small animation. See, this is Dutch roll. So, this happens on its own. It is not intentional. The pilot is not doing it. If you look at the literature, you will get some confusing information. There is something called a Dutch roll maneuver in which the pilots do this intentionally. But that is not Dutch roll. This one is something that happens naturally. Why does it happen? It happens because there is a coupling between the longitudinal and lateral modes during flight. The coupling and all of the aircraft is not equally stable in all modes. So, the level of stability of the aircraft is not the same in all the modes. So, if you are flying and if you enter into a yaw, so what will happen? You will fly sideways. You enter into a yaw. Let us say you go this way. Now, this side of the wing and this side of the wing, but the two sides will not get the same air flow. So, the lift on one wing will be more, on the opposite side will be more. So, it will start rolling towards that side. Okay. So, let us see, now let us see this, now what I showed you is just an animation, let me show you a small video of Dutch roll. Watch carefully how the aircraft behaves. There you go, you see it starts entering this kind of a behavior. This is Dutch roll, this is happening on its own. 
So there are terms like the amplitude of Dutch roll, frequency of Dutch roll, okay, and uh, all of these are a function of the aircraft characteristics. So the size of the vertical tail is a very important uh, parameter in what is called as Dutch roll damping. This has to be damped, otherwise it will keep on happening. You will never be able to come out of it. Just like the animation. It's an animation. It will keep on happening whole day, whole night. But you don't want to fly like that, right? You would like to fly stable. So if you enter into a Dutch roll, or if there is a Dutch roll coupling created, the pilot should have enough vertical tail to overcome the Dutch roll. Right. Then you have control. Now in control, engine out flight at low speeds. Now look, there is an interesting thing. One is you need stability to cancel to take care of engine failure. That means you have to create trim. That is when you are flying. There is also a requirement for control. Now if it so happens that the speed at which the engine failure occurs is very, very low, then the aerodynamic loading on the vertical surfaces is not enough to give the moment. At that time, you would like to deflect the rudder to create the desirable moment to cancel. You have to intentionally cancel. For that, you need some rudder area and rudder deflection. So that comes under control. Then when aircraft has to go for roll, because roll and you are coupled, it is very important to have enough vertical tail area to cancel out. And finally, there is a phenomena called a spin. And it is very important to be able to recover from a spin. So what do you know about spin? Have you heard this term spin in an aircraft? Hmm? So what is spin? So when one wing stalls and the other wing is still unstalled, therefore what will happen is there will be a roll. And then Why will it pitch down? Loss of aerodynamics. Loss of so, one wing has lost lift. So, let us say it happens like this. This wing has lost lift. So, it happens like this. Now, where is center of gravity? Okay, no, do not take only the wing, take the whole aircraft because we are talking about aircraft. So what will happen? That means if one wing stalls, the nose should go down. Okay. So let us say one wing stall on the nose, I am not agreeing with you but I am just saying suppose it happens, then so it will stall and the nose will go down, then what? Well, let me show you a spin, you will appreciate it when you see it. Now spin is something that no pilot wants to enter. Okay. Intentional spin is not desirable and if, if you enter into a spin and if the aircraft cannot recover, then you are gone. So there are some aircraft where there is a placard which says aircraft inherently incapable of returning from spin, which means please be careful, do not enter into spin because if you enter into spin, the only thing you can do is pray to God. Because the aircraft is inherently incapable of entering a spin. And uh, pilots who are not very trained, young pilots, rookie pilots, they sometimes enter into a spin by mistake. So therefore, they are taught to enter into a spin and to recover from a spin. But now let us look at a simple passenger aircraft with let us say, let us say a small GA aircraft. Now, big aircraft like 747, they are difficult to stall, they are difficult to spin also, unless the pilot has, a, has got a tendency of suicide and all that, that is different matter, but otherwise, no, do not laugh at it, it happens, it has happened recently, why are you laughing? You should be aware of these facts, 250 people lost their lives because the German pilot wanted to commit suicide, he was under the controls, do not you know about this case? So, nothing to laugh at, but this is a fact and we could be in the passenger uh, manifest on one day in an aircraft where the pilot has tendency for committing suicide. So nothing to laugh at. I am just saying that uh, it can happen. So for a small general aviation aircraft, it would be nice and safe if the aircraft can recover from spin. So 
So I'll show you the video of one company which has designed an aircraft last year and uh, they show, so look at their confidence level, they are going to fly the aircraft with passengers, make it into go into a spin and not one, not a simple spin, they will do 10 turns in a spin and then recover. So it's a very interesting video uh, using GoPro camera at three locations, in the cockpit, in the wingtip and the tail observe how that aircraft enters into a spin and you can, you can read the text on the bottom, they will give a commentary by text. The audio is only music. So this is the camera at the wingtip looking at the aircraft, there is one camera mounted behind the pilots. So this will be a 10 turn spin and with 4 people on board, so look at their guts and they are getting 3 fourths of fuel, there you go, you have entered a spin, now imagine you are sitting in the aircraft, this is how it flies, the earth is spinning in front of you, that is why it is called as a spin, a very stable spin because it is not it is not increasing, the rotation is constant. Height is being lost, 9000 feet, some buffeting, 7, uh, 7th uh, round, 8th round, 9th round, observe how they recover from the spin, that is it, simple, recovered in one turn, okay. Now look at the same phenomena from another angle. from the wing tip mounted GoPro camera. Alpha increase, aircraft stalled, entered a spin. These numbers are the rounds or the turns in the spin that are being encountered. Look at the propeller. This is free wheeling propeller now, no power. That's it, recovered. And now pull on the power. Okay, I will go back and I want you to look at now. Look at the tail. This is eighth. Look here, this is 9th, this is 10th, there you go, you see, you see the rudder, rudder is straight in 8th, in 9th, there you go, rudder starts deflecting now, there you go, full deflection of rudder and then back. There is one more view from the tail, this is the most interesting view. <clears throat> this is how you will be if you are a passenger inside the aircraft and the aircraft goes into the spin. Notice, alpha increase and immediately the world starts spinning. This is not simulation. Look at the wake here, it tells you what is happening to the aircraft. That is it, recovered. So they have designed the aircraft to recover from the spin. Just a minute. Ah. How did they induce the spin? By taking the aircraft into uh, an angle of attack. Now, any aircraft 
actually never has totally symmetric lift on both the wings. It is never the case. There is always some imbalance here or there. Okay. There could be imbalance created by having different amount of fuel in different fuel tanks. Okay. So, in this case, they wanted to go into spin. So, they already had some imbalance which was being cancelled by the control stick. And the moment they went into nose up, the aircraft stalled. Once it stalled, now the spin started. And when spin started, because of the coupling, it will keep on spinning. So, what is the motion of the aircraft? It is sent to a tightening spiral. The height is being lost. You are oscillating. And you come like this. So, how do you recover from the spin? The recovery from the spin is by using the full opposite rudder. The aircraft was spinning toward the left side. They applied full opposite rudder. And they are demonstrating that even when you are into a spin, our rudder is effective. It is able to cancel the spin in one turn and bring you back to safety. In many other aircraft, the rudder is not effective. It is in the wake of the fuselage. So, half the rudder is in disturbed flow, ineffective. Only half is there. So, it becomes difficult to recover from a spin. So, the size of the rudder and the vertical tail is going to be decided based on the spin recovery characteristics. Okay. Now, let us look at the configuration options. Now, we know the design requirements. Let us look at the options. What options do you have? Yes. So, for the passenger plane, generally, most of the fighter planes are built to be inherently unstable. They also have the spin stability using rudder. Yes. They have spin stability using rudder. They also, they also have some, some aircraft also have what is called as uh, some kind of a dorsal fin on the fuselage to cut out the tendency of rolling because of spinning. So, there are many ways. There are spin parachutes available for stabilizing in spin. Uh, so, spin recovery is itself a very interesting research in flight dynamics. So, you are welcome to look at it. How to design the aircraft to overcome spin? There are many, many options. In fact, when we do the sizing of tails, now this is just introductory lecture, we will probably visit that area. Okay. Let us look at the configuration. Now, the conventional tail, which is the one that you see in say 747, center mounted vertical tail, fuselage mounted horizontal tail, this kind of a tail and mounted in the center of the fuselage on the rear, this is called as a conventional tail and it works beautifully. 70 percent of the aircraft have tail of this type. So, there is no need to depart from it unless there is a reason. So, what could be the reason? One reason is that the place where you are mounting the vertical and horizontal tail, that place is reserved by somebody else for some other reason. Then you cannot put the tail there. Can you give me an example? I will just have the engines in the rear side. Very good. So, if there are, if there are, uh, if there are, now do not say that small private jets only have it, there could be other aircraft. So, we can just say any aircraft which has the engine mounted on the fuselage on the rear for any reason cannot have the conventional tail because it will come directly in the hot wake or exhaust of the engine. So, you have to move the tail. Okay. Any other example? 747. Correct. So, if you are carrying a huge payload, if you are carrying a huge payload on an aircraft, like if you have this say, shuttle mounted on top of the aircraft, then you have to keep the rear free. Otherwise, the rear will be always in the wake of the space shuttle. Okay. What else? Good example. Yes. Right. No, they can still have because opening can be through a little bit ahead of the tail. It is on the bottom side. Na? So, in some cases they will not be able to, in some cases they would be. So, good. You are thinking on the right lines that if on the fuselage on the rear there is something else which is needed, you, you, may, you may have to move the tail. I agree. It may not be always true, but it could be one reason. So, these are some of the reasons. So, my suggestion is do not go for unconventional tail unless there is a solid reason because this is time tested, this is based on history, this is based on past experience. There is no logic in doing things unnecessarily. 
So, this is the conventional tail, fuselage mounted tail is conventional. This one is called as a cruciform tail, like a cross, but this is a low cruciform tail. You just move the horizontal tail up, little bit up. This is the T tail, you have moved it all the way up. This is the triple tail. So, we will look at this and many other configuration, configurations and we will discuss why these have gone, why are there. First, let us look at T tail. T tail is uh, a tail in which the horizontal tail has been moved completely up. The, the reason for that is, for example, in this case, you have this huge engine on the back and you can even see here the hot wake of the exhaust of the engine. Obviously, if I put a tail here, I am going to start melting it very soon or I am going to use, I have to use heavy material like titanium or other heat resistance, inconel alloys, which will make it very heavy and complicated. So, the best thing is move the tail away, okay. But the advantage is there, if you move it all the way up, like in this case, it is all the way up, then what you have done is that for the vertical tail, you have given an end plate. That means you have somehow removed the trailing edge of the vertical tail. And you know that on trailing edges, you have tip vertices. You have a mixing of flow from the two surfaces that causes drag. So, if I put something there, this is called as the end plate effect. So, the size of the vertical tail will be reduced because smaller area will be as effective as a larger area. So, by putting, by, by moving the horizontal tail up, you have made the vertical tail more effective. You can go for smaller vertical tail as compared to a free vertical tail. So, that is beneficial. You clear the tail from the wing and the propeller wash and the engine wash. These are the positives. But if this was only positive, every aircraft would have this. There should be some negatives also, right? You have a question? Get a greater moment as compared to because if you have a swept back vertical tail, it will be helpful. Okay. Yes, when you have a when you have a T tail on a swept back vertical tail, you get slightly more moment arm also. Agree. But we do not design it for that reason. We use it for that reason. So therefore, therefore the horizontal tail area will come down because you have another few, maybe another meter or so more momentum, okay. So, the horizontal tail area also might come down if the vertical tail is swept. But remember, swept surfaces are heavier, structurally they are not lightweight. So, whether you, you say weight on the horizontal tail area, but you gain weight in the structure of the vertical tail mounting, net net it may be of no effect. We do not know. When you do it, you come to know. What else? Are there any drawbacks? Yes. What drawbacks do you think are there? Why would it be heavy? Because tips are narrower. You have, to stiff the you have to stiffen the tip, correct. So, the vertical tail will become heavy because far away at the tip you are having loads. So, now those loads will transfer moment to the structure also. Earlier, earlier there was load coming on the horizontal tail which was mounted somewhere here. So, those loads were transferred to the structure at the and you had a nice fuselage frame there, ring kind of a structure. So, you can put one ring in the front spar, one ring in the rear spar of the horizontal tail and you can transfer the load just like you transfer the load of the wing on a structure of the fuselage. So, you can have lightweight structure. Now, you have a problem. This entire vertical tail is going to be loaded because of the deflection of the horizontal tail plus the tip area which is more flexible and which is weaker because it has less load. It is a cantilever, it is far away from the mounting point. At that point you have a heavy thing. So, you have to strengthen that area locally also. So, the vertical tail will be smaller but heavier. Okay. What else? During deep stall, not during stall. So, what is when that deep stall? Deep stall is when you have a very high angle of attack. Okay. That is the condition when you are prone to stall. At that time, so your vertical tail, your horizontal tail was free of the wake in normal flight. Great. 
very good. But when you need it the most, it is submerged into the wake of the wing. This means the recovery is almost impossible. That is why it is called as a deep stall. So, T tail is good for conventional flight because the wing wake is not hitting the tail wake, tail is very effective. But when you need the tail most, it has the problem. And secondly, it is going to be heavier. So, what you do is you, you decide the wing location in such a way that at normal angle of attack, the wing wake is not hitting the tail. So, what you do you put some incidence on the wing. Remember the wake of the wing goes back and down. Okay? So, if it is sufficiently back and if it is properly angled, you can design it to not hit the tail. So, when you look at tail sizing, there is a factor called as the uh, tail efficiency, it is 80 percent, that is because of disturbed flow of the wing. So, by careful, so location of the, the relative location or, con, or layout is decided by these factors. So, you may think it is going to be always in the wake, but by careful design of the wing, you will find that the wake is normally below. Okay? So, T tail, yes. Hmm. Can we easily? Yeah. Yes, it will help. In a, a conventional tail is very good in high in stall recovery because during very high angle of attack, it is going to be away from the wake. So, it will be very effective. So, the problem with T tail is deep stall. So, you have to be very careful not to allow aircraft to go into very high angle by some other means. One way is canard. Angle of attack, tail is down, wing is very high. Configuration like when angle of attack and attack tail drops, that time also tail. Yeah, so you see there is a boundary. The relative location between wing and tail, there is a boundary. You should be either above this or either below this. If you are exactly in this area, you will be in disturbed flow. So I will show you a graph which shows the boundary of mounting of the horizontal tail with respect to the wing. You are right, some areas are out of bounds because there will be interference between the, there will be this problem. So, why would you use T tail then? Some people say it is stylish. Okay? And style plays an important role in design. As you have seen, there are people who make uh, special efforts to make a stylish aircraft. So, T tail is considered to be stylish. It looks a little bit different and away. So, advantages are looks faster less firm object damage from engine and landing gear because it is far away. So, the rubble and the stones and the other things which might be created because of the vertex of the wing uh, of the engine will have less chance of hitting the vertical uh, horizontal tail if it is T tail and it allows the mounted engines. But pilots do not like it. There is one more issue here. In the case of a conventional aircraft, when pilots especially propeller engine pilots give throttle. They increase the propeller RPM, RPM to create more thrust. They also increase the air flow velocity and that air flow velocity gives you larger control authority. So, they are happy. The aircraft becomes more controllable when you have more power because now you want the propeller wake to see there is a difference between propeller wake and wing wake. Wing wake is disturbing, propeller wake is something that can energize. So, in a conventional tail, you can submerge the horizontal tail in the propeller wake intentionally to make it more effective. And pilots are not happy with T tail because there is no connection, there is no connection between the throttle and the tail efficiency. Style, it is just a matter of style because many of them have sweep back on the top and it is just, I mean you can call it whatever you want, it is just style. Okay. And then there is also a serious problem of maintenance. Now, this was discovered during one very interesting incident that took place. 
uh, when I upload these slides, I want you to read this document. I do not want to tell you about this. You read, a, do a self study. There was an accident in uh, the McDonnell Douglas 83 of Alaska and the reason for that was attributed to the T tail design. So, what was the reason why it was this is meant for your self study. Some examples of T tail aircraft and I think you should be able to now figure out the reason why T tail has been given. From now on after you complete this course successfully, the moment you see an aircraft you should be able to argue out why this configuration is there. Otherwise the course have not taught you anything. Apart from sizing, apart from calculating the numbers, see you must be wondering this guy just comes and keeps talking here, is this design just listening to stories, very soon you do calculations, then you will get a flavor of analysis or calculation in design. But in conceptual design, we really do not have the time in the classroom to do a lot of analysis. In the aircraft design lab which follows this course, you will have more time to do analysis. At that time if you, if you feel that is what you want to do, you can take up uh, more analysis oriented things. But in this class you are going to spend quite a bit of time understanding why things are done in a particular fashion. So, let us look at these three examples. Okay. Uh, the ETA glider is considered to be one of the most efficient gliders flying today. What parameter, what single parameter will you consider as a good judgment of aircraft's aerodynamic efficiency? Which parameter? L over D, lift over drag. So, this aircraft has a fantastic L over D of approximately 5, 0, 50. Okay. But do not get excited because there are aircraft with L by D of 70 also, but very, very special aircraft. So, I would like you to find these aircraft. Okay. I want you to tell me what is the L by D of ETA glider? What is the L by D of some other sail planes? Do you know the meaning of sail plane and glider? What is the difference between a sail plane and a glider? A sail plane is basically a highly efficient glider. Okay, that is all. It is a highly, glider means aircraft with no engine, that is it. A sail plane means a very highly efficient glider which is supposed to sail in the ambient wind using the thermals. So, ETA glider, look at the flexing of the wings. The wings are made of composites, they are very lightweight, they have very high aspect ratio and therefore they are flexing up under the load coming. So, the ETA glider has a T tail, what is the reason? This is for pure aerodynamic efficiency, we just want the horizontal tail to be completely away from any kind of wake. Then you have the F101 voodoo aircraft. It has got, uh, I cannot call it as a T tail, this is a cruciform tail because it is not all the way up, it is somewhere at 70, 80 percent. What is the reason? The exhaust. It has got this rear mounted jet engine and the exhaust would have been very bad, it would have burnt. Then you have Piper Tomahawk, this also has a T tail. You have Canadair RJ with rear mounted engines, therefore it is T tail. Okay. Now, let us look at cruciform tail. We just now saw a T tail. Cruciform tail is a compromise. It is not all the way up, it is not down, it is slightly away. So, it is a compromise solution. Okay. So, you will see many aircraft which have a cruciform tail. So, they want to be conventional tail, but they move the vertical, the horizontal is slightly up just to be away from disturbances. Now, how do you decide how much up you should go? Whether, whether it should be here or here or here, this one is here, why is it not here or here? Only through wind tunnel testing and CFD analysis in the, not in the conceptual design stage, but in the preliminary design stage. That is the stage when you do these tests to find out where it will be optimum. Okay? Because the more you go away from the conventional, you will have those drawbacks, but you also start getting benefits if you go all the way up little bit benefit of this uh, shortening of the vertical tail. So, you have to decide based on whether style and that is important or this is important. So, there is no firm answer here, but these aircraft are examples of various levels at which people have gone to mount the tail. Yes. 
this one ATR 42. Right. So, this particular thing is called as a dorsal fin okay. and this dorsal fin is provided when the area of the vertical tail that you need for something like one of the three things that we discussed, trim, stability, control. Now, there will be no control here, it will be only stability and trim. So, if you want X amount of area but you do not want the tail to be very large in height, then you start putting area in the front portion here at the cost of lower moment arm, but you do not want to really load plus also central gravity also will not be moving far behind. If I put a very large surface on the back, then my CG starts moving back. So, the areas, these areas are decided purely on the basis of requirements to meet. So, some aircraft do not have, for example, this aircraft it is able to meet the requirements without having a dorsal fin here. This one has a small dorsal fin. Sometimes you have to mount a few things, antennae or some equipment. So, you use that area and you say additional. So, the, the side area of the aircraft is very carefully calculated with the center of gravity uh, locations available. So, these are some aircraft, just trim 31. The Avalanche 6, Falcon 20, ATR 42, which are having this cruciform tail. Okay, twin tail, two tails instead of one vertical tail. So, very many, many aircraft have it, especially in military aircraft, you know. Uh, so, one thing is many military aircraft have huge vertical tails because the requirements on the controllability and stability are very large, especially multi-engine aircraft, they have very large vertical tail. So, sometimes you cut them into two parts, so that the overall height is reduced. The other reason is that if there is a fuselage whose wake is hitting the rudder continuously, so central tail is disturbed from the wake of the fuselage, you move the tail on the side. It also helps in fin resistance because now there are two surfaces at some offset. So, if one is blanketed, the other one is working. If this is blanketed, this one is working. So, it is better in fin resistance. But you know, if you have two structures, then you have more weight. Even if you cut the area into two and put twice, the mountings will have some weight. So, the total weight will go up. No, we are talking about only the vertical tail right now, this no, is uh, ah, twin tail. Sir, just this modified, modified version yes. of AN225 that had the twin tail, right? So, AN225 usually has the… Yeah, 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 that is only as he said for, for carrying the, this is Buran. So, for carrying the space shuttle, they wanted this area to be free because otherwise it will be completely ineffective. So, they put the vertical tails here, okay. There are other reasons also why you have twin vertical tail. Look at this aircraft, for example. You have twin vertical tail here because you have twin engines. Now, why do you have twin engines? Not for higher thrust because I can get one engine of higher thrust available. Requirement based on safety reliability. If one engine is hit, if one engine is hit and it is damaged you can still have enough thrust to come back home at least, right. So, it is a requirement, you are right, it is a requirement, it is not uh, the choice of the designer. Given a choice, I will choose the minimum number of engines. So, you have two engines, they are mounted side by side. This aircraft is going to be prone to be hit by heat seeking missiles which will aim at the engine or which will seek the engine because that is the hottest part of the engine. So, the vertical tails which are outside the engine are going to blanket the hot part of the aircraft from the heat seeking missiles. So, from the rear, from the rear angles, see from the front if you start, if you hit a heat seeking missile it will not lock on very easily because the hot portion is behind the aircraft. Even the fuselage and the wing will mask the exhaust. 
but if you are being aimed from the back at say angles from something like 45 degrees on both sides from the back, if you are right behind then nothing, no masking can help you. But at least the vertical tail will mask at a few angles on the side that improves its uh, battle worthiness. So that becomes another advantage of having twin vertical tail. So not only you distribute the area into two pieces so that the vertical height is less, you also blanket your exhaust and engine from heat seeking missiles. And in some cases the area is so much that both the tails are moving. That means the entire thing is a rudder and when locked the entire thing is a stabilizer. The twin tail is very common, very common. Then we go for other types. So H tail or triple tail, first look, let us look at triple tail. Triple tail is you know if you really have very large vertical tail and even 2 is not enough, you cut into 3, you can make it 4, 5 but then it becomes very complicated and heavy. So people have not gone beyond 3 tails. So the only aircraft that we know that is actually flown and built in reasonable numbers is Lockheed Constellation and this is an aircraft which has got 4 turboprop engines and it has got a triple tail. In this case the designers claim that we had to go for a triple tail because we were not able to fit this aircraft in the existing hangars if we go for a twin tail or a single tail and the tail requirements were very large. So this is best of both the worlds now. You have a conventional vertical tail chota and then you have two small chota vertical tails additionally. So I would call it an augmented vertical tail. Then you have some other reasons. Now uh, at high angle of attack you will have undisturbed airflow on the vertical tail because you have moved them away. So when I say H tail I only mean two, two tails on the tips of the horizontal tail. So now you are getting end plate effect on the horizontal tail at both the ends. So you will have a smaller horizontal tail. And uh, the engine will have some kind of a propeller wake and if you have horizontal tail, uh, vertical tail moved outboard, it will now come in the wake of the propeller, it will be more effective. So in the engine out case, with a smaller vertical tail you can create the required moments to balance. So this is an example. Now in this case, in this case, this is a packet aircraft. In this case the uh, P-38, not packet sorry, P-38. So you have these two vertical tails here outboard and then you have a HT inside but some projection here because that area is not enough, <coughs> you need more area. So it also very, it is a very good structure, it is a closed structure. Loads are being transferred to all members now. So even structurally it is very good. You will have lower problems of vibration in this because it is a rigid structure. And here this area is for para dropping. So you people have to drop out from here. From here people jump out. So you cannot have a tail behind. You want this area to be clear. So for that reason they have gone for this configuration. Yes. See, engine the engine out controllability is done by deflecting the rudder in the air stream to give the moments to cancel the engine out imbalance. If I have a H tail, this vertical tail is in the propeller wash because there are propellers mounted on the wings and now you are moving the vertical tail in the wake of the propeller so they are more effective. Smaller area because of the propeller wash will be more effective. Compared to air stream acting on area X, I have air stream and propeller wake acting on area maybe 0.7 X. Both are equally efficient. So therefore you will have a smaller vertical tail or with a smaller vertical tail I can, I can balance it. If I do not have H tail. I will need a bigger vertical tail to balance because I have only air stream to help me. Here propeller is giving me additional extra push. Okay, let us go to now butterfly tail or V tail. This is a very interesting thing. Butterfly tail was suggested because <coughs> one surface less 
therefore it will give you better lower weight stealth because the central member has gone the central member the vertical tail in the center is a very big reflector so from stealth point of view if you have it's like you have split and made it like this so in this area in front you have lesser signature these two surfaces can be used to deflect the radiation because they can have angled edges see they are actually at, already at an angle so at certain angles you can deflect the radiation so this is the purpose why f117 a has twin vertical tail uh, sorry butterfly tail or v tail main thing is one surface less so very attractive so if you have one surface less then you have lower interference drag also because interference drag comes because of presence of surfaces in the presence of other so if you have three surfaces there will be interference of vertical tail on this horizontal stabilizer vertical tail on that and vice versa you will have less interference you will have lower weight but you need higher complexity because now the two inclined tails are going to have rudder waiters they will have rudders come elevators so they have to move differentially they have to move together so in one condition they will do the work of rudder when they move together and in one condition they have to move differentially when they have to work like a elevator so to do this the pilot's input has to be sent to a mixing unit which will determine which surface to deflect how much that is a complexity now if you are going to have a flyer wire control system you don't mind because anyway all signals are going to be sent through the flyer wire system so this is like a small delta x complexity but if you have to do it only for this it's a complicated situation so many people discontinued now beechcraft bonanza is a very was a very popular aircraft this was one of the most uh, popular general aviation aircraft in the us which was used by doctors for you know going in their own aircraft flying their aircraft to meet patients which are in rural areas in remote locations so there are rich patients who need to be attended and us is a very large country you know area wise it's thrice the area of india with 16 the population so <clears throat> this large country people many doctors were able to afford their own aircraft and take it very popular among doctors it's very stylish butterfly tail also looks very stylish different from normal but it soon became doctor killer because these doctors are not experienced pilots they are pil they are they are professionals in medicine who learn flying as a hobby or just for their own personal use they are not skilled pilots so there were problems in controllability because of these rudder waiters so it became a commercial failure so they started with a law of fanfare and they said bonanza has a v tail there are ad which said it looks different and all that after some time they came back to the conventional tail so you can see the same aircraft started with a v tail and after few years they forgot the v tail and they came back to the conventional tail because it was difficult so you can read about this why aircraft were failing there was some issue regarding the stresses also on the root of the butterfly tail because of this complicated country and then there was a study by naka which said okay the the area required by these two two tails is actually equal to the total area of three tails okay so they said that because they are at an angle they are not so efficient one horizontal one vertical is efficient because the deflections are all correct in the sense you get the best efficiency when you make it inclined and you have these two doing the part of three you have to resize them in such a way that the resized area total area of butterfly tail was equal to that resized area of the conventional tail so then what is the point even the wear also is not going to be beneficial so there people lost interest in it and now they have come back now rarely you see butterfly tail except for things like stealth so you might see a even in f117 there have been many failures in the control system okay i'm not saying because of butterfly tail i'm just saying that 
people think of many things and eventually then only time tells whether it is really useful or not. Then there are other examples which are having T tail. Now V tail, what is the reason here? Here you have an engine mounted on top. So the logical thing is to move the tail like this so that this area can give the exhaust. Okay. Then same thing here, it is an Eclipse 400, a very beautiful small aircraft for dual uh, GA. They wanted to have a clear engine away from the ground in, in undisturbed flow. So they mounted it here. So then they had to go for only a butterfly tail. Similarly, Global Hawk, which you know can fly for around 36 hours non-stop. It has got an engine mounted on top, on the back. There is some reason for it. So once the location of the engine is fixed, and this is a UAV, which will be anywhere remotely flown by experienced pilots. So they went for a tail. Plus it also helps in stealth, yeah. They can go for S tail, but S tail is heavy, they do not like it. They said if you can manage with only two surfaces, why to have more surfaces? Why to have three? No, the area is same compared to a conventional tail. S tail will have more area than even conventional tail. So, see, when designers design these configurations, they try all these things, they work out the numbers, they work out the uh, now, we do not know all the answers because only when you do the exercise, you will know what exactly happened. So, if you look up Global Hawk design information, maybe they have tried edge tail and other tails and then they found it is not, not effective, not suitable. Okay. We do not know, but we know that ultimately they went for this particular tail. This also gives shielding because this engine will have an exhaust and there are people going to attack this aircraft also. So there will be people on the ground trying to shoot it down with heat seeking missiles. So this will also do, this will also. So it is a cross between, you can call it as a, as a V tail or as a twin tail, we do not know. But no horizontal tail. Yes. These things, what do you think? These are tip mounted fuel tanks, which are there in some aircraft. Because the during during the aerodynamic testing of this aircraft, they must have observed some very heavy vibrations at the wing tips. So to dampen the vibrations, one thing is to make the tip heavy. So many aircraft have these wing tip mounted fuel tanks. By careful design, you can even break away the vortex, tip vortex. So it's like an end plate. Plus you carry extra fuel hmm? or some other thing, whatever whatever you want to carry. In this case, they have carried extra fuel. So many aircraft have a conservation like this, where the tips are loaded. Okay, let's now look at wing geometry. Now this is a figure from Professor John Fielding's textbook. Uh, there is one thing in this figure which I want all of you to once and for for all time understand carefully, and that is. You might say what is so strange in this figure, this is a simple figure, but the area which is hashed, it has a particular name. What is it called? Wing platform area or wing reference area. Notice it includes the area inside the fuselage. It has no physical significance. Basically, it means nothing. Do you agree? It is just a geometrical construct. What you have done is you have extended you have extended the wing from the root of the fuselage to the center line at the leading edge and trailing edge. In the aircraft, actually speaking, this area, this area is going to be immersed inside the fuselage. There will be a fuselage there. So actually if you say wing area, you should include only that area which is exposed. So the name is called as exposed wing area. It is rarely used. Okay. So what is the significance and importance of this particular area? There is no physical significance. It is just a convention that when you say wing area, 
you say you mean this area. Area of the wing in the top view including the portion inside the fuselage in which the leading edge and trailing edges of the wing root junction are extended to the fuselage center line. So, when we say that this aircraft has a CD of 0 0.025 and if I say calculate drag, you will say drag is equal to half into rho into V square into S ref into CD. So, half is a constant, rho is the density of the air, V is the aircraft free stream velocity. What is this S? It is this area because the person who calculated CD and gave you also calculated the CD based on this area. So, it is a pure convention. So, this is the definition of wing reference area and if you want to calculate unless somebody says that I am giving you CD wet which is with respect to wetted area then you can use this or CD as exposed whatever it is if someone does not say anything that person assumes and you must assume that this is the area to be used. That is why it is called as a wing reference area. And then you know the root cord is this, it is not the cord at the wing fuselage junction, it is the extended cord at the center line by definition. So, this is the root cord C naught, this is the tip cord C T, okay. So, the ratio C T upon C 0 is called as taper ratio. This ratio can be how much? Can it be more than 1? Can you have tip cord more than root cord? Yes, you can. You can. Have you seen any aircraft like that? There is. There is. So, please find out. On the Moodle page, I want you to tell me which aircraft has got tip cord more than root cord and why the hell have they done it? Why have they gone for tip cord more than root cord? Like ulta wing. Why? There must be a reason. Okay. It has flown. But I do not think they made large number of aircraft, which means they decided not to continue with it. So, then what was the reasoning? What did they try? What did they get? This is another Moodle question for all of you. But generally, C0 upon uh, CT upon C0 generally is going to be 1 or less than 1. Okay. When it is 1, it means it is a straight wing, I mean uh, rectangular wing. Okay. Then you know about uh, thickness to chord ratio. Yeah, it could be swept rectangular or unswept rectangular, but it is rectangular. So, <laughs> you have you have uh, this definition of thickness to chord ratio. So, you have maximum thickness anywhere upon the root chord that is the T by C ratio. How much is this ratio T by C ratio? For a typical aircraft, what is the range of T by C? 10 per, what is the minimum you have seen? Ah, 3 to 4 percent is minimum and what is the maximum you have seen? Maybe 20 percent, maybe 18, 20 percent that is the maximum. You know you do not see more than 20 percent and you do not see less than 3 percent. So, typical value of transports is between 12 to 18 percent, typical value of military aircraft is from 3 to about 9 percent very high speed aircraft in between you can have higher. So, is T by C good to be less or more depends on what. So, for what condition will you like to have high T by C? Yeah, but why? Why? Only because of Mach number. Subsonic plane means Mach number is less than 1. So, are you saying that if Mach number is less than 1? Only then you will, is that the only reason why you go, go by low T by C? What is the benefit of high T by C? You can put more volume inside. You have more volume inside. So, not only fuel, landing gear will be hai. So, be very careful. So, yeah, fuel is the first consideration, but wing also contains landing gear. Structurally, it is good to have high T by C. Why is it so? Why does, why does high T by C give better structure because 
Yeah, but then that will be heavy. Hollow, also. Hollow you put hollow structure. So that means you drill holes to make it light. But is that the reason why you only you have high TYC just to put hollow structure? No, you put a structure and make it hollow to reduce weight. Hmm. Hmm. Not bending moment capability. No, no, no. You tell us the right thing. Bending moment will be based on the loads coming. So what is it called? Moment of inertia will be higher. So sigma bending will be less. The stress, the bending stress will be less. Because you can put, see what you do is normally you have a spar structure. I will show it to you. So we will have one class on structures. We will talk about all that in more detail there. Okay. Then the other thing is aspect ratio which is span square by area, B square by S where B being the distance from the outer tip to the outer tip and area being this area, reference area. So here is one very interesting slide which talks about the effect of various geometrical parameters on the weight of the wing and on the typical range of the values for that. So let us look at it one by one. The first one shows you what is the effect of aerofoil camber. Camber means curvature. From the aerofoil mean line, how far away is the maximum thickness location? That is called as a camber. Correct? Yes or no? I am just giving you a rough definition of curvature. So if you have high curvature, you have very high CL, but you also have high drag. So you have to be very careful. But that does not affect too much the wing weight. So wing weight is not affected by camber that much. So camber is normally 0% that is symmetrical wing to around 6% positive camber. Sometimes we have negative camber also to create the moments. Especially when you have a flying wing, you may go for a reverse camber at the back to give you the control on the wing pitching moment. At a fall T by C, there are these graphs which indicate to you the effect of T by C increase. It is basically higher CL max because you have larger radius of curvature in the front. So you will have more acceleration of the air. Okay. So CL will increase but CD will increase much more if you have high C by D, high T by C. Okay. So the wind weight will come down because of the structural reasons. So you have 5 to 8 percent, 18 percent in subsonic and you have 3 to 7 percent in supersonic aircraft. Aspect ratio, if you increase then the term KCL square where K is 1 by pi aspect ratio into E. There, because of that, there will be lower induced drag. So the wing weight will go up. Now why will the wing weight go up because of high aspect ratio? So the wing is slender, slenderer. Therefore the structural bending moment at the wing root will be larger. So you need to take make provision for that. So typically the aspect ratio is 7 uh, to 9 in subsonic aircraft and much lower in very high speed aircraft because aspect ratio if it is high in supersonic flight you will have very high wave drag, paper ratio and leading edge sweep. So this information is all there for you to have a look at and refer. Then aspect ratio is the most important parameter which gets or which plays a role in all disciplines. It affects weight, it affects controllability because of flexibility. It affects aerodynamics because of induced drive. Okay. So aspect ratio reduces induced drag, reduces stalling angle of attack, increases subsonic L by D max, increases the wing weight. So there is a problem. If you have low aspect ratio, notice this line is at low aspect ratio, not only is CL max reduced, even the DCL by D alpha is reduced and the alpha at which you get CL max is also increased. That means you have to come in at a high angle. So you saw a video yesterday of the Raptor F-22 at a high angle. Okay. Aspect ratio was low there, around 6 to 7. Okay. There is a reason for aerodynamic braking. But you look at an aircraft like Concorde. When it comes into land, the angle of attack is very high. Why is it so? Because there is an aspect ratio of only 3. Why is it low? Because it is supersonic. So the design requirement is supersonic flight. 
therefore aspect ratio has to be low because aspect ratio is low the angle of attack at landing will be very high and that's why the nose is bent to increase the visibility of the pilot at landing so all aircraft with low aspect ratio space shuttle is an example they come at very high angle at landing which is not good so aspect ratio has to be very carefully monitored you make it large the weight will go up because of flexibility the structural response will go up because the controllability will suffer it will flex more you will have more aerodynamic aerostatic problems but you have better aerodynamics but you have higher weight so there is always a constant battle that's why we call it as a ultimate parameter in, in <coughs> aircraft design you have to get the aspect ratio right you will never be able to get the solution in one pass because aspect ratio will be decided after many iterations then you have sweep taper ratio twist incidence all these you are supposed to know yes so it is not good that is a mistake that is a mistake it is bad it is very bad so this smiley face has to be changed I will correct it taper ratio taper ratio basically uh, is there are two three reasons why we give taper ratio one is to reduce the wing weight because you say that on the outboard portion anyway we are generating less lift so why have more area there why have more area at the tips so you knock off you reduce the weight you have a lower wing bending moment lateral wing but then there is a serious problem in the stalling behavior the stalling is very vicious in uh, when you have when you have a taper ratio when you have very high taper that means when the ratio is low tip to root chord ratio is low 0 0.3 0 0.2 there is a serious problem the tips are loaded more as you can see uh, lambda 0.25 is when the tip chord is one fourth of the root chord so you can notice that from zero to tip fraction of wing span the distribution is more towards the tips so the tips are heavily loaded and that is where the ailerons are Okay. It is not a good idea. A good idea is to root should be loaded more than the tip. A good distribution will be elliptical distribution which has got more in the center and less in the tips. Here it is off elliptic. You have distribution like this, low in the, low in the central portion, increasing towards the tips and then suddenly falling. It is not desirable. The moment you make taper ratio 0 0.6, you can notice the loading at the root becomes more, the loading at the tip becomes less. But then aircraft becomes heavy because the wing becomes heavier. Taper ratio 0.6 means the tip is 60 percent of the root. So there is a compromise solution, and it is said that a taper ratio of between 0.4 to 0.45 is the best. It's the best compromise. So many aircraft have a taper ratio of around 0.4 or 0.45. That is the reason because that is a, a good a good geometric a good mean. Okay, then let us look very quickly at how many engines should be provided in the aircraft. So what would you decide? You are a designer, you are given a choice. How, how do you decide the number of engines? How will you choose the number of engines in the aircraft? Based on requirement. No, you will not be allowed to go. So you have no choice. A regulatory body will say no to engines. So will you go for two engines or three or four or five or six or eight? You would go for as low as possible because what do airlines like? Least number of engines, less maintenance problem. What do air, what do air forces like? Least number of engines meeting the safety requirement. Again, less maintenance. Otherwise, you say we are waiting. One engine is there, one is not there. Is gone for repairs. So everybody likes to have least number of engines, but you may not have in the market enough engines meeting your requirement of thrust so then you may have to go for two three four etc so there is no ex there is no data from accidents or emergency whether three is better or four is better or two is better okay minimum two is required from regulatory bodies for most aircraft but whether two or three or four or five there is no clinical data a large number of aircraft with two engines have crashed large with four have crashed so just by having more engine does not mean that you are safer. Hmm? Airlines prefer more, uh, least number of engines. Sometimes it is uh, based on availability. Hmm? 
but then this two engine rule was created to allow safety of operation when you fly over what it is called as ETOPS extended range twin engine operations extended range twin engine operations is called as ETOPS. So, this was a requirement which came up. Now, this is one, one example taken from the flight operation manual of an aircraft just to explain to you. So, let me first explain to you what is meant by ETOPS and how it affects the route planning of an aircraft. If your aircraft is cleared for 90 minutes ETOPS, it means that with two engines you can fly 90 minutes and within 90 minutes of flight there must be some aerodrome where you can divert if there is any problem. So, this is the departure point okay, and this is the ETOPS entry point. This point is the ETOPS entry point. So, basically when you start from here and you start flying anywhere inside this circle will be the 90 minute radius. So, that if something goes wrong, you simply come back and land at the departure airport. Okay. Now, this is an alternate airport number 1. So, the, when you fly from here and if you reach somewhere here, now you have two choices. If now one engine fails, either you will come back, either you will come back or you will go here. So, this airport E Alt 1 should be available and should be capable of handling your operation with one engine not working. Okay. So, which means any line of flight along this route along this route is acceptable for me because I can safely go to either to the departure or to the E Alt 1. Now, this is so once you cross this okay once you cross this this is called as a equi time point so from equi time point either you can go here or you can go here okay now this black line is the etop segment so i want to go from here departure to destination what would be my preferred flight if possible would be a straight line subject to ATC regulations straight line. But no, I cannot fly on a straight line because all along my flight I must have airports which can allow me to reach that place the alternate or the original port within some x minutes of flights. So, when, when in, in early 70s when Airbus A320, when Airbus A300 was the first aircraft on the Airbus table, at that time the competition was Boeing 747, which was four engine, and then there were other aircraft like, <coughs> you know, LH1011, so there were three engines or DC10. So they said, this guy has only two engines, and it's a new company. Okay, so it will be unsafe to allow them to fly long distance over the water. So they got a 90-minute clearance then that over the years they showed that with two engines also we are very reliable. So, it, they went for 120 minutes, 180 minutes, okay, 200 minutes. Now, it is 270 minutes. So, now the ETOPS clearance <coughs> available is up to 270 minutes. That means, you should be able to fly within 270 minutes, you should be able to land to any alternate airport. So, especially when you fly over the sea, you will be surprised there are some airports which have been created in the middle of the ocean just to act as the alternate airports in case of uh, any problem. And if that airport closes down, you have to either cancel the flight or you have to divert it along some other route. So, read about this. Uh, these are the websites from where the pictures have been taken. Uh, okay. So, there are many, many possibilities we have to choose. Okay, so, I think with this we come to the end of today's class. I just want to make some announcements regarding the quiz.